Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliane Camfield. I'm the director here at Deutsche Haus at NYU. Thanks for coming out on this dark and stormy and rainy and otherwise uh, not the best of all nights night. We're delighted to have you. And we are, of course, here to discuss the death of liberalism and its rebirth. We didn't put it with a question mark. I guess we could have put it with a question mark, but we didn't put it with a question mark. Perhaps it's wishful thinking, but we'll find out. And this is also, so to speak, after the colon, we have uh, the role of civil engagement. No, the role of civil, no, I'm getting confused, civil society and political engagement. And that is part of our series, um, the states we're in a new age of transatlantic relations. And that's why I kept getting confused about the title because it's very unwieldy, but there it is. And we are very happy to have the four panelists here. We have Claudia Wiesner, we have Boris Forman, we have Mark Blythe and Sherry Berman uh, who will moderate and I will read uh, their bio information to you shortly. Just a few words of thanks. First of all, of course, to the panelists for coming here from around the corner and from Fulda and from uh, Brown, so <laughs> um, different distances. We appreciate uh, your coming here, especially Claudia, who just flew in this afternoon from Germany. And I want to thank the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their support, because Boris is our current DAAD uh, visiting scholar at Deutsches Haus, so thanks DAAD. And uh, I also want to thank the transatlantic program of the, where is that information? Oh, it is here because it's rather long, the transatlantic program of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, uh, they support us with funds from the European recovery program uh, of the Federal Ministry for Economic, for Economy and energy. So now, now I'm done with all the uh, boring but very important stuff. And uh, in terms of the topic, we probably all followed recent elections in Brazil, in the US, in uh, several states in Germany. We had the so-called Landtagswahlen in Bavaria and Hesse with uh, interesting results that uh, are all part of a global pattern of um, people coming to power uh, parties coming to power that uh, several years ago we all probably would not have uh, believed would come to power or at least not to such a degree. So these are interesting and uh, perhaps somewhat um, um, disturbing tendencies. The, the results here in the US were of course mixed and we're I think still waiting for some of the election results. I didn't really follow what's happening in Florida and Georgia, but they're still counting, so great. Um, in any case, uh, these are all my announcements. Please make sure to silence your cell phone and now I'll read you some biographical information about our panelists and, and just in the uh, regarding the general format, uh, we'll, we'll have the conversation and then afterwards you have a chance to ask questions. Two more things I want to uh, announce in terms of events that are coming up on Monday. We have our uh, Zanda Prize 2018 ceremony and the Zanda Prize will be awarded to Dr. Henry Jaraki. We're very pleased about uh, this upcoming event and it will be uh, combined with uh, our next um, panel that is part of the States We're In series. That's the same series that we have the panel here tonight. And the focus uh, of that panel will be on educational policy and academic freedom. So if you have time on Monday, that's another, I think, very timely topic. Of course, we see all over the world that scholars have to flee oppressive regimes and where do they go and uh, what can universities do, what can individual countries do. So that's the next topic in this series. Okay, now I really shut up with all my announcements and we'll read the bio information. I'll start with Sherry, who is the moderator. Sherry Berman is professor of political science at Barnard College. She holds a PhD and MA from Harvard and a BA from Yale. Her main interests are European politics and political history, democracy and democratization, globalization and the history of the left. Her two books, both published with Cambridge, have examined the role played by social democracy 
in determining political outcomes in 20th century Europe. She has published in prestigious journals like the Journal of Democracy and Perspectives on Politics. Mark Blythe is Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs at Brown University. His research focuses upon how uncertainty and randomness impact complex systems, particularly economic systems, and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas <laughs> despite buckets of evidence to the contrary. I think this is one of my favorite bios ever. It's very, <laughs> very insightful and brief and provocative, so it wakes us up. Um, he's the author of several books, including Great Transformations, Economic Ideas, and Institutional Change in the 20th Century, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, and The Future of the Euro, which he's the co-author of. Boris Forman, as I mentioned, is currently our DRT visiting scholar. We're very happy to have you for another 10 days or so. And uh, he is, if he's not here, he's professor of politics and head of the politics concentration at Bard College Berlin. He has held appointments as visiting professor and lecturer at the CUNY Graduate Center, Harvard University, New York University, and Freie Universität's John F. Kennedy Institute for North American Studies. A regular commentator on public policy debates for different media outlets in Germany, and I think you've been very busy here in the past week <laughs> for obvious reasons. He has lectured widely in Germany, Canada, the UK, France, and Jordan. His latest book, Die Krise der Demokratie und wie wir sie überwinden, I have a copy here, is currently being translated into English. What will be the English title, Boris? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, very well. Uh, that's a uh, useful thinking, probably. Uh, Claudia Wiesner is professor for political science at Fulda University of Applied Sciences and adjunct professor in political science at Uvescula University. Do you know where that is? Frankfurt. No, nope. Finland. <laughs> Uh, right? It's Finland? Yes. <laughs> Previously, she was acting professor for comparative politics at Hamburg, Bochum, and Marburg University. She has also been a visiting fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies and at the European University Institute and the Berlin Social Sciences Center. Her main research interests lie in the comparative study of democracy, political culture, and political sociology in the EU multi-level system. She especially focuses on changes of concepts and institutions, as well as on the related debates and discourses. Wiesner's second field of research is public policy, its evaluation, its reform, and its theory. Here she has a long-standing experience in public policy consulting. She chairs the ECPR Standing Group Political Concepts, has led several research projects and international cooperation networks, and was visiting fellow at universities in the US, France, Finland, Greece, and Spain. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel, and thank you for coming tonight. So here's how I think about everything. So this is, this is a book that's going to happen at some point. So this is how it goes. At the end of World War II, after the Great, Depression, the Great Depression, the rise of fascism and a global catastrophe, one of the things that policy, political elites learned in the West was you have to insulate labor markets. If you subject labor markets to simple price competition and if you have open financial flows, you will destabilize those labor markets and you will cause a lot of volatility in those markets, which basically means labor gets annoyed. When labor gets annoyed and that, part of that coincides with large financial crises, you get into big depressions and then the politics of that get very nasty. So learning from that, we decided we would insulate labor markets and we did that in the United States with COLA contracts, cost of living adjustments. You did that in Germany with corporatist institutions. You had big labor on one side, big business on the other. Everything was negotiated. In a sense, it was a labor market cartel. Hold that concept in your head. So that cartel worked really well for a while. And at the same time, product markets were actually quite protected. We had a world in which we had countries that all made similar things and then traded them with each other. Whereas now under globalization, we have countries that do very, very different things and then trade very differently with each other through much more integrated labor markets and much more integrated financial flows. But before we get there, those product markets and labor markets, which were highly regulated, think the way that America used to do airlines, 
Right? Think about the fact that you couldn't open a bank account anywhere except in your home country. There were no derivatives. There were no global financial flows. That system produced a ton of inflation, and that's when it blew up in a crisis of inflation in the 1970s. In order to restore the value of capital, we underwent an experiment, which is variously called the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions, neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it. And once you unleash those forces, which are basically things you do, you integrate, you privatize, you liberalize, you marketize, you create a lot of openness in the system. And all of those protections, first in labor markets, either deliberately through policy, beating down on unions, or alternatively much later through things like market integration, which basically says to German workers, you're not really gonna have a pay rise for 12 years because globalization for you starts 60 kilometers east of the Elbe. If you don't like it, we'll move the, place, we'll move the factory to, let's say, Romania. So there's a great deal of labor market discipline brought into it, and productivity breaks its link with wages. And we see this across the OECD beginning in the 1970s, and this is the big beginning of the big inequality skew. So to fill that in, what happens? We liberalize finance, and everyone borrows, whether it's governments or households or individuals, and we triple private credit in the United States, and we double it in the European area. So we all live off of debt, now, you can do that so long as interest rates are low and your incomes are growing, but your incomes aren't growing because you can no longer claim your share of productivity. So what happens is we start to get a massive skew in inequality with all those things going up to the top 1%, as we know. Now, in 2008, that system had a heart attack, but rather than allowing it to crash and reset, we bailed it out with $17 trillion of public money through the central banks of the world. And what happened was another decade in which wages didn't grow and more and more people got annoyed, and they were told they had to tighten their belts and do more with less, while the top 20% weighed off with even more of the gains. And at the end of that, something else happened. We started to notice that unless you were a digital monopolist like Google, the, your product markets were incredibly stressed too. Think about the price of computers, think about the price of cars. From a consumer value point of view, it's amazing, but you think about the margins of most businesses, even if you've got globalized supply chains, they're incredibly tight. So businesses are getting squeezed, labor markets are getting squeezed. So the second cartel, the product market cartel, falls apart with globalization. And we try various things like the EU to basically create a region-wide cartel, but it doesn't really work. And then at the end of it, what's the last cartel standing? It was the political cartel that made all of that possible. The two-party system and multi-party democracies that guaranteed all of those institutions of the post-war compact. But all those institutions have been bypassed. They're irrelevant. They've been blown up. They've been integrated, marketized, privatized, globalized, both in product markets and in labor markets. So what exactly are they there to do? So they talk more and more, they tweet more and more, they govern less and less. They externalize to agencies such as the EU, the WTO, they push it up, they push it out. You have election after election where less and less seems to be decided. And eventually when the system has a heart attack and has a 10 year cardiac arrest, and we're told that everything's fine because the top 10% and the top 1% are doing fabulously well. It turns out a lot of us don't believe that story anymore. And we start to defect from that cartel. And we start to go other places. And we don't like some of those places because they remind us of the 1930s. But the system itself is broken and it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. Okay. Always fun to speak after Mark, I guess. Um, well, I think, I think my story is pretty um, complementary, but it focuses on a different level. And um, a couple of points. I think uh, if, you've, if you've followed a little bit the news about uh, Germany, which you probably have since you're interested in the Deutsches Haus, uh, it, the crisis of, of liberal democracy looks quite specific from a German standpoint. Uh, so depending on your perspective, you'll get quite, quite a different take, takeaway message of what this is all about. From a German perspective, this looks like a failure, a long-term failure of reunification. It could also look like an undermining of, uh, of in political institutions uh, in the specific uh, context of Germany. It's also an inequality between the East and the West. Uh, so it looks like a very specific um, rise of neo-nationalism that needs to be treated with its own uh, instruments. If you zoom out, though, you see that there's something similar happen in other contexts. Um, uh, Brexit uh, in France, the Front National makes it into the second 
uh, round of the uh, presidential elections. Then there's Trumpism, so you cannot just explain it with the refugee crisis in Europe because there was, despite the caravan, uh, no, such, uh, no such crisis in the US context. So the first point I'm really trying to make is that there's some, something structural here in long term that goes beyond uh, the individual context as such. Uh, second thing is, this is not a crisis that comes above us from the outside. It's not an external but an imminent crisis of uh, liberalism. Uh, sometimes, and I think this is why the, the, the term populism is problematic, sometimes it seems like there was this epidemic of nationalist fervor that was just coming over us from the outside. And it's hard to explain from that perspective why we find ourselves in this uh, predicament. Uh, the argument that we're making in this book is basically that there's been this crisis within liberalism. And let me just try and take a step back and explain a little bit more what we mean by that. And by we, I mean uh, Christian Lammert, who's obviously not uh, in the room, but who's teaching uh, in Berlin. Um, one aspect of this is, uh, or the main story that we're telling there is that this has been a hollowing out of political liberalism, a certain strand of liberalism that uh, vouches for specific uh, values, religious freedom, the freedom of, uh, of speech, uh, a certain cosmopolitanism, so a set of political values uh, that has been hollowed out over time on a theoretical and a practical level by um, an economic dimension of liberalism which argue, argues for markets uh, for the sake of efficiency and productivity gains. And so uh, what has happened basically with the fall of the wall and the lack of a system alternative um, has been uh, basically the argument that economic liberalism would automatically also lead to political li liberalism. That is, if markets are expanded both domestically and globally, there will automatically also be an expansion of democracy and religious freedom and uh, freedom of opinion and freedom of the press, etc. And so this seems to be backfiring. Um, the other more practical part of the story is the hollowing out of the Fordist compromise that uh, Mark has just described. Uh, the provision of not just the protection of labor markets, but also the provision of public goods, such as infrastructure investments, uh, educational investments, healthcare, uh, old age security. And this is something we see across the board in the transatlantic context. So a, a stepping away from this notion of social citizenship and the protection of certain public goods and the provision of public goods redistribution of re uh, productivity gains, uh, stepping back and hollowing out these, um, these buffering systems uh, through, the, through the market. This can work for a while. The principle of meritocracy can work for a while as long as people believe in the fact of upward mobility. But with increasing inequality, uh, it has been become plain to many people that uh, this notion of the American dream and also the German dream or the French dream, the Trente Glorieuse or the Wirtschaftswunder uh, has uh, come to an end. And so uh, I think this is one of the reasons why the financial crisis has also been so important uh, because it, it has amplified uh, this kind of uh, this kind of problem. Last point, um, in order to overcome, it, to overcome this hollowing out of political liberalism, I think, and this ties back to the title of this, of this uh, panel, I think we need to rescue and revitalize uh, civic institutions. Uh, and by that I mean uh, institutions such as schools or high schools, universities, um, places where people can meet in order to interact. Um, with the privatization of all those public goods, people don't just live in different media worlds. There's a lot of emphasis on media polarization and filter bubbles and echo chambers. But this is also true spatially, right? We live in different spatial worlds. We live in different institutional worlds. Uh, children go into kindergartens where they just meet other children whose parents do the same kind of job. So with the privatization of these different institutions, we have a disconnect. And so we have no means to rediscuss um, uh, the public good. Uh, final point, on very final point, on the midterm elections and anti-Trumpism. Uh, I think that the Democrats uh, might not win the presidential election in, in, in two years' time if they stick to the script of just arguing against Trump. There has been no articulation whatsoever of a, some kind of a social project or an economic project. Uh, so I think if the analysis is right, if this is not just about populism and some kind of an irrational craze, but if this is also about social policy, uh, there needs to be some kind of a debate about redistribution, about decommodification, getting markets out of certain systems again, and of response, responsiveness and responsibility of political institutions. And I'll stop here.
<coughs> okay, somebody has to take a contrary position here. So I'm taking or I'm starting with this role. There are a number of comparative political scientists that just say there is no th such thing as a crisis of democracy. I just read uh, a number of articles in, in the plain. There has been a debate in the Journal of Democracy. And there are really solid empirical findings that uh, stating that there is no crisis, there is no deconsolidation of democracy. Um, why do I say that? Um, because I think the picture is, is really complex, even if I share, I think, 95% uh, of what uh, has just been said by, by Mark and by Boris. Um, coming back to the set of questions that sort of we, we have been sent in preparing um, this event, the first question was, what lies at the core of these illiberal tendencies? And I would like to argue, and, and I think here I will be uh, differentiating a bit from you, that we do not really have the one explanation for a rise of right-wing extremist and populist votes in the Western world. I think that what you said about the economic factors is one major explanation, but I think there are others. And there are also, and this is, this is my main point, there are also aspects when the picture becomes blurred. If you look at Germany, for instance, we have this rise uh, in votes for the alternative uh, for Germany, which is now in every uh, Länder parliament and also in the German <laughs> Bundestag, which is a really a new phenomenon for Germany. And it's, it's frightening for me as a German, but when you look at the German economy indicators, you see that most of the classical indicators that lead to a breakdown or to a crisis of liberal democracy are not realized in Germany. Unemployment is low, um, the eco uh, there is no economic decline. And the only thing, and that links uh, to what uh, Mark and Boris have been saying, is that inequality has been exploding uh, relatively in German terms. Uh, the Gini uh, index has been really uh, rising very steeply under the red and green uh, Schröder government, not under the conservative government. Um, another point, um, I just uh, taught a comparative course on populism and we looked at examples uh, from Germany, from France, from the Netherlands and also from Brazil. And uh, we found out that one thing that those populist uh, politicians have in common is that they seem to appeal to a deep frustration. And my argument is that this frustration is very abstract. Um, it's, it's not even really linked. It maybe has its roots in these economic problems, but it's not really actively linked um, to the economic si uh, situation. It's, it's more a deep frustration against the political class, whatever that may be. Now, I think in France you can speak of the political class because they, uh, I mean, 80% of leading French politicians have been to ENA, but that's not the case in Germany, um, for instance. And uh, I don't think it's the case in Brazil, yeah? Then another point um, c in common, and you haven't spoken so much about that, is that most populist movements have a deeply felt or expressed a deeply felt fear against another, an undefined threat, but what the other is can, can be uh, very different. It can be Muslims, it can be, as in the case of Brazil, indigenous people, I was really, and, and women. In Brazil it's women as well. Um, and in Germany, it's, uh, it's the, this, this word, I, I hate it, it's, it's very pejorative, of gut mensch. Yeah? It would be probably the liberals here. Yeah? Uh, gut mensch. Good, uh, I, it's, it means somebody that always thinks men are good when they are in reality evil. And those nasty liberals that always want to help the poor, you know, and, and the refugees and, and, and those guys. And uh, my argument is that, that it, it is those very unspecific points where most right-wing uh, movements seem to attack. And I would also argue that it's for a reason that those points are very unspecific, because they can be made moving targets. Then uh, a second question was whether there is an end to the deep polarization and widespread populism that is anywhere in sight. And here again, I would say it depends. It depends first on whether we as we sit here, we as political scientists and also politicians, take up democracy as a challenge. I, my, my argument is that democracy needs to be defended. Democracy not only needs to be lived, but it needs to be defended, uh, which for instance means if you have the AfD in the German Bundestag, you need to fight a battle with them. And um, I would say that um, to, to some degree, um, this is what happens currently. Um, but we also need to care, and that again links to the economic uh, discussion we had at the beginning, uh, we need to care about these economic indicators and we need to care about inequality. Um, and I think um, that's sort of the third point um, that have 
that, that is common to the populists and where they attack is the fear of a loss of status, whatever that may be. And the loss of status can also be relative in the sense of um, I'm relatively wealthy, but I still, I'm still afraid of losing my relative wealth, even if I'm not going to be poor. And that can be also a fuel um, to a populist vote. And then as to what civil society can do against that, um, I, I would like to ask or to invite asking first what civil society or which civil society. I live in the city of Frankfurt and, and what really goes, uh, really unnerves me about the city of Frankfurt is that it's so socially segregated. It's probably not shocking to anybody who lives in New York, but for a German it's quite shocking. In particular, we have a lot of private schools in Frankfurt. Now I must underline that it, that is something that is forbidden by the German constitution, which sets very severe limits to any private schools. They are only permitted really in very exceptional cases. But in Frankfurt, you have really loads of, they have been popping up like mushrooms in the last 10 years, private schools that charge between 500 and 1,500 euros per month. And I know all this because I have two children in school age and I wanted to avoid having to send them to private school. We are a full-time working couple, so we need daycare and only the private schools provide for it. Now, sort of I'm asking myself why a rich city like Frankfurt doesn't provide any daycare. Yeah, and it means that in, in we are in Germany, we are in conservative fascia, so elementary school or any school ends at 12 o'clock. Why does it end at 12 o'clock? Because mommy is home, of course, because if she's not home at 12 o'clock, then there's a problem in the family. Um, and the private schools, yeah, yeah, I, I'm one, you know, um, but the, and the private schools cover up for this problem and they, they, they the deliver until between four o'clock and six o'clock. So a lot of people that are sort of in our situation send their kids to private schools and there's absolutely no reason and it's interdicted by the German basic law. And if we sort of in these circumstances then say, oh, let's have civil society engagement, um, you have sort of the, the non-working mothers uh, that sort of engage in the school in terms of civil engagement and you don't have such a thing as society. Yeah, I, I would like to reverse uh, the sentence of Margaret Thatcher, who once said there is no such thing as society, and argue we probably need something, uh, such a thing as society back. And then maybe my last argument, because I think my time is up, I think we need to think about a joint public space and not a split one. Um, and this is something that I especially um, see in the US, but I see it starting in Germany as well. When people don't share one space of exchange, but uh, the one party watches Fox News and uh, sort of the other party reads the New York Times. At least this is sort of my image uh, of what takes place in the US. And we have these tendencies in Europe as well. Great, okay. So um, let me start by just throwing out um, some questions and um, any of you can um, feel free to answer. So let me start first with the economic causes of our contemporary crisis since both Mark and Boris um, stress them. So this is obviously a fairly common type of explanation and it's one I think probably all of us in this room are fairly sympathetic towards and have heard before. Um, but there are several obvious problems with this explanation. The first is that there's very little correlation between the support for the attractiveness of populism and how well a country has done economically over the past generation. So you have populist success in places like Poland and Sweden, Denmark and Germany that have been relatively successful, albeit with some serious economic problems. Growing inequality would be the most obvious, but there have been economic problems in the past. Countries have gone through downturns without a rise of populism, so that's problematic. The second thing is research has found it very difficult on an individual level, not just on a societal level, to connect people's personal economic circumstances to their tendency to vote for anti-establishment parties. This is profoundly true in the US where people have tried over and over again to link people's personal economic situation. How wealthy are you? Are you unemployed? Are you in a manufacturing area? And there's just no correlation between those things and tendency to vote populist. And so there is this kind of larger question. I think all of us think that economic conditions matter and it'd be hard to argue that things like the financial crisis didn't make a difference, but you've not mentioned any of the other things that people would normally mention, immigration, cultural changes, technological changes, which Claudia 
um, brought up, albeit indirectly. So I'd like you guys, and perhaps Claudia, you can weigh in, to discuss a little bit more about exactly what connections you see between these economic failures and these economic problems and the crisis of liberal democracy, or more specifically, the rise of populism. Because those two things are very closely linked, but they're not exactly the same. So I did have five minutes, and there's only so much you can do. So we're going we're gonna to spread the time. Exactly, right. All right, but here's the thing. Most of the studies that show the things that you say, I think, are deeply problematic because they're based upon public opinion data. And public opinion data ask questions which are very specific, and they're not actually designed to test the things that you want. So you're using proxies of proxies to get at much more complex things. There's a huge literature that actually shows import competition shows up incredibly robustly as a way in which populism gets activated. There's another one that basically looks at, rather than the Gini coefficient or um, um, uh, average incomes, it's wage stagnation over the long term, particularly if there's a slight decline, a sort of a slow rotting of the fish from the head down. That tends to be statistically very significant. So even with relatively well-off places, if you Boston, Lancashire is the classic one, if you have uh, ex-migration of the kids going out you have foreign workers coming in to replace them, and you have a slow, de steady decline in wages, even from a high level, very likely to uh, accumulate populace. It's always the interaction. But this is just one. Well, this is just one in the sense that, you know, I'm not arguing it's a one-to-one -one monotonic relationship between the Gini coefficient and stuff. That's stupid, right? You know me. I would never argue that. And, of course, economics is always expressed culturally. You experience it. So let's think of the exceptions. Romania has the same sort of history as many of these European countries are doing very well just now. There is no populist reaction in Romania. If you look at the south, all of the debtor countries if you exclude North Italy, right, has uh, a, a left-wing populist reaction, which does not demonize migrants. If you look in the North, it's the creditor countries that basically demonize the South, all those lazy Greeks. They're the ones that have the self-righteous nationalist reaction. So these things are culturally encoded, and it's very hard to separate them, and we shouldn't separate them. We should understand how it is that Brexit resonates for workers in Sunderland when 90% of the cars that they make go to the EU and the 62% of them vote to get out of the EU. And the reason that they get, if you talk to them, and people have done this and interviewed them, is why do I care if GDP is going up? You keep telling me GDP is going up. I never see any of it. So why should I care? If every contract I sign means I get a crappier bathroom break and I'm under more and more stress to speed up the line, otherwise you'll move the plant to Romania, why should I care? So I think when we talk about these surveys that say, but really, the economy was growing under Obama, so that says it's not economics. I think that's just stupid social science. All right, maybe, maybe two points. Um, one of them is, and, and that's an argument that actually oftentimes made with regards to Germany, where people say, well, Germany is doing pretty well. It's come out of the crisis strong. It's even benefited from, this, uh, from the crisis. GDP grew, uh, growth is strong. Uh, but what people tend to forget is that uh, it's been on the back of a, a massively expanding uh, low-wage sector. Um, the uh, main discussions up, leading up to the federal elections last year were not about immigrants and refugees. Uh, I mean, in public discourse they were, but uh, in, the, in the polls that were made, uh, the main focus was on pension, retirement, and on, uh, on social, social security questions. So so um, uh, it's a bit of a distorted uh, image we have um, of, of Germany, I think. Um, but you're right. I mean, this is a relative question, and it's a complex picture. And the, the crisis itself is metamorphosing. So I think that the cultural aspects of this crisis and the um, extremist tendencies tend to become stronger over, t over time. I think it's nonetheless important to point out the economic uh, causes, because if we're thinking about policy solutions, uh, if, we're, if we think this is just populism and some kind of an irrational outbreak, then we'll talk about education and re-education, basically. And um, I think we need to think about these other dimensions as well. The second point is uh, the urban-rural divide. Um, uh, plus the manufacturing uh, regions that tended to vote populist in these, uh, in these elections across the board. I mean, if you look at the Brexit re referendum, if you look at the German federal elections, if you look at France, um, tr uh, the, the US, uh, it's always the old manufacturing uh, places that voted against the uh, status quo. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that redistribution didn't just happen from the rich to the poor, but there was also in the Fordist or 
post-World War II context, redistribution in a spatial manner from the cities and the strong urban centers uh, to the rural regions. Plus, obviously, the manufacturing basis was in these rural regions, so the jobs that, had, that came with social security and that came with all uh, these privileges were, were hit strongest by globalization and these processes we've been describing. So I think this also, I mean, the spatial dimension is really uh, important. We tend to forget it from a political science perspective because space doesn't matter too much to us. Um, again, I, I don't have to so, so much to add on your economic diagnosis. But I just uh, would like to highlight uh, once more that I don't think it's the immediate explanation. In, in no, or not so many of the populist discourses, you find references to what you have just been describing. So I would um, strongly agree with both of you that this is probably what is behind. It's, it's a deep root of what we are experiencing. But um, it doesn't mean that there is a, a simple or not even a causal link to, to votes for populist parties. Two examples to underline what I mean. I, I read with great interest um, Ali Hochschild's book on uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, um, where she goes to Louisiana. Uh, I, I'm not really familiar with the US, so please forgive me if I'm sort of saying, saying something wrongly here. It's really an outsider's view. But she explains that people really are poor and that people lose their jobs, and nevertheless, they vote for Donald Trump and they vote for very market liberal Republicans that want to cut down social security below the level where it already is because they believe it's right and because they believe that sort of uh, regulatory politics are evil and are not what God wants or, or whatsoever. So I think that's one explanation um, we, we, we must take into account, that it always depends on how the story is, is sold. That's one thing. And the th second thing, um, I would like to sort of turn back to Germany. What we have in Germany is that we have a tendency towards what we call a two-thirds society. So you have two-thirds of the society that are more or less well integrated, and you have the lowest third um, where there are really problems. It's those that have the bad jobs, though they have the bad wages, they have the least social security, um, they struggle, struggle the most, and they are the most at risk of losing their jobs. In the moment, we have nearly 0% unemployment, but if there were more, they would lose the jobs. And this is sort of where I think it crashes uh, with the migration uh, question. Um, and the discussion that we have, and I must admit that there's some truth at it, is, is, is that they don't move to where the Frankfurt housewives live um, that have the rich husbands and they don't, don't have to work. So they can have happy and nice civil society and charity events to help the refugees, but they move in the neighborhood of the poorest quarters where the lower third of, the two, of our two-thirds society is living. And there they take away, and, and unfortunately this really is true, that there is a, a, a competition on, the, on the, 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 the housing market because we don't have enough uh, housing that's nearly affordable in Frankfurt. And you could put it in parallel for any other German city. So I think we really have to look concretely at sort of where things clash. But again, the debate then is not like bloody hell, uh, why I, am I in the lower third? And it's not a debate about redistribution, but, and this is sort of where the populists attack, the debate is, is one that uh, is, is, is saturating to, to, to people that it's the migrants or the refugees that are the problem. And that it's not the distribution, it's not the two-thirds society, but it's because some poor Syrian people come because there's war in their country and this is the problem. Mm -hmm. And sort of the idea is that if they go away, we don't have any problems anymore. And by the way, sort of my, my most favorite enemy in, in German politics now definitely is Horst Seehofer by far. Um, because he sort of uh, fueled this debate uh, saying that it's migration that is the mother of all problems. So uh, he has been the biggest helper of AfD in the last uh, 12 months uh, by putting always fuel um, in, in, into this fire. Just to amplify that point, um, one of the key statistics that doesn't get mentioned is uh, replacement rates and fertility rates in Europe. Europe's really old. So your average German is 45 years old, your average Italian is 46 years old, and the German replacement rate is 1.4. So the country has, the politicians of the country have promised everyone an 80% replacement rate on their pension, and they haven't had enough kids. Now the only way you can do this is to have migration. I mean, it's literally the only way to do it. And the entire political class has decided, no, let's argue the complete opposite. That seems to me to be incredibly telling about a class, if not democracy in crisis, a political class in crisis. 
Okay, so let's continue um, actually and let's take up where you left off, Claudia. So part of what you're saying, and I think this really is something that um, is worth thinking about on both sides of the Atlantic, is that part one of the places where the nexus of economic and social and cultural causes meet is in the place where politics has failed. So that part of the reason why um, people have turned to blaming migrants, immigrants, refugees for their problems is because they have a perception of a sort of zero-sum type of game, whether it's housing in Frankfurt or, and actually Arlie Hochschild's book is much closer to your thesis than even you said, because the problem for folks in Louisiana is that they simply don't believe that their taxes are going to fund programs that are going to help them. They think their taxes are funding programs that are going to help someone else. And so that's how they can reconcile their rejection of government social policy because they don't actually see it as helping them. So this brings us back to this question of not just economic causes, not just social and cultural causes, but a failure by the quote unquote establishment to actually deal with the challenges that they face, be they economic, be they migration, yada, yada, yada. So let me ask you then to follow up on your previous comments in this way. So if it's not just that there have been serious economic challenges, and it's not just that we've seen mig in actually truly unprecedented migration flows, let's get that out there. Even in the United States, we have numbers of foreign-born citizens now, percentage-wise, that we have not seen in over a century. So that is a significant shock, just as the economic changes are. But clearly, right, shocks become problems when governments, parties, politicians, whatever, don't deal with them. So starting again, perhaps we could go in the other direction. Why is it, would you say, that all of a sudden liberal Democrats, again, our establishment, has proven so inept at dealing with these challenges? If I could answer this question, I would be a very well-paid policy advisor. So I just have thesis. Yeah? Um, but my thesis really is that it's it's a bit, well, le let me paint a very bleak picture, but I sometimes think of the orchestra on the Titanic. Yeah, Keep playing to the end and do whatever you have been doing and don't care there has been an iceberg. Um, and it's, no, but th this is what I think about German social democracy. It's a very sad story. Um, but... Uh, this is the, the, the idea that I have. We have always been doing it that way. Why should we change it? And maybe family policy in Germany is n not such a bad example. We had Ursula von der Leyen, and it's very telling. I think she's a conservative. And she said, okay, hey, we have to change something in this country because there's a problem here. And she made a number of changes. But uh, this is part of the reason why Angela Merkel is now in trouble because uh, the ladies in the Christian Democrat um, Party um, had um, made enemies of all the conservatives with the conservative family values, because they said we now re need to reconcile having a family and having a career for women, and they made sort of they, they built daycare and they made laws and they changed the infrastructure, and that's a shock for a conservative German with conservative family values. So, so does this is. One example uh, telling to both sides, because it was not the Social Democrats, neither the Greens who introduced that it was the Conservatives, and they now have to pay for it. That's one thing. A second point is that I think you have a very strong tendency of we've always been doing it that way, so let's continue. Personally, I think that the current government uh, that we have in Germany in, in, on the practical level does quite a good job. They have done a number of good laws. Only nobody is talking about it. Yeah. Um, so, and I think there's, it's a kind of disconnection that sort of they have lost the ability to sort of address what people's feelings are for some reason. And I don't know why. That's maybe a kind of blindness or a kind of self-reflexiveness or a kind of self-centeredness that you stay in your own circles. And to end, maybe, because I said that this is so telling, uh, a, a very sad example um, of the, the Social Democrats. When I told this story about Frankfurt schooling to a Social Democrat um, official, I told uh, him or her, I don't know anymore, um, hey, listen, you should be aware of that. This is a core Social Democratic topic. It's about equal education. So where is the Social Democrat outcry? Because we don't speak about just one school. We speak about, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 children per year that go to private schools and not to public schools. So social segregation, so they are missing in the public schools. Where is the answer? 
And you know what the answer was that I received? Oh, I see, you are angry because you have a daycare problem. <laughs> and I said, I don't bloody hell have a daycare problem. I have a dual income. We are dual income academics. We can pair the bloody private school. I'm speaking of a society problem here. And there were sort of, and, and it's, a, it's a kind of client, clientele thinking or whatsoever that was happening there. And it was not the awareness that as sort of in, in soccer, the, the ball is uh, right in front of the, of the goal and, and nobody sort of is hitting it. And I, I don't, don't ask me why. I, I, yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I can follow up and say I also don't know why, but I would, uh, I would. That's okay, I know why. <laughs> I, okay, I, maybe, I know part, maybe I know part of the story. I, but one, thing, one thing I would argue is that um, despite all polarization, there has been a convergence um, in two-party systems, but also in multi-party systems, on certain understandings of how um, the econ economy should be run, especially after uh, 1989. Um, uh, and that is basically an idea that globalization, liberal globalization, is something that is inevitable, inexorable, but that at the same time benefits all, and that will somehow trickle down. Uh, and I think this story is now backfiring. Um, and uh, both social democrats and Christian democrats in Germany, both uh, the um, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the US have basically bought into that story and have agreed on that point. Um, and I think this is, um, this is now backfiring. Uh, the Democrats still can't decide if they should stick to the old script and, and, and to that kind of narrative or if they should reinvent themselves. Same with the Social Democrats in Germany, which have a pretty tough time of doing it because they're in a great coalition. They're basically being hugged to death uh, by the Christian Democrats. So um, this is exactly what people predicted. If they enter the great coalition again, they won't be able to uh, articulate some kind of a party program and that's exactly what we're seeing. It's impossible for them to, uh, to revitalize. And uh, I th so I think that's, that's part of the story. So two, two quick ones and then a story. So the first one is, it's important to remember that AFD started off as an anti-Euro party. So, you know, the economics is always in someone's mind. So the treasurer of that party, who is now on the Treasury Committee in the Bundestag, uh, was the head of the Hayek Society. I mean, there's a deep, deep neoliberalism to this, which is using sort of nationalism as a way of essentially trying to get around the fact that people have sussed out globalization 1.0 might not be a good idea. Second one is many of these parties, think Le Pen, for example, were around in the 1990s and they got nowhere. Why? Because there was an illusion of prosperity. We hadn't had yet another 15 years of wage stagnation for 60 to 80% of the population. They didn't matter, they were freaks, they were fools, but they waited for their moment, and their moment came only then because the economic conditions were right. So my inner Marxism tells me that the economics is there. Now here's the third part, and this is the important one. I have a PhD student, a postdoc now, and he just gave a job talk, and the slide that he started with the picture with tells it all. So the first part of the slide is uh, a bunch of workers on strike. And then the next part is a Wall Street trader with two phones. And then the next one is a bunch of smiling professionals who are all very diverse. And he said, what's that? And everyone looked at him, no, no, that's the Democratic Coalition. And the guy in the middle is the most interesting because he's the one that generates in financial markets alpha. He's the guy that makes the money that makes your pensions work because your public pension system doesn't work anymore. So he's the one that basically creates the material conditions for a coalition of the top 20%, even in the Democratic Party and even in New Labour and even in Sweden. And all of these dynamics are very, very similar. So what you've got is this weird system whereby giving up on the old working class coalition, which we effectively did in the 1990s, meant that we moved to join in with a bunch of people who are very fickle and who are a minority of the population. And so long as we keep generating alpha for them, they're happy occasionally to vote for us. But that leads to a politics that we have in the United States, where it's basically my billionaire's nicer than your billionaire. So you can have Koch brother libertarianism on one side, or you can have San Francisco basic income humanism on the other. But do you actually get to choose anything? Nah, not really. All right, so um, let's just continue with a couple more questions. One brief one that um, has come up now several times is the question of the left. 
So one might have expected, especially insofar as one thinks there are economic causes for our contemporary democratic malaise, that this would have benefited the left, which has historically been the force most critical of capitalism. But in fact, with the exception, as you've already mentioned, of the Southern European countries, where I actually think the history of dictatorship has more to do with the fact that there's no right-wing populism, but that's irrelevant. Um, that Actually, this crisis has not benefited the left. In fact, the left has seen itself ripped to tatters over the last 10, 15 years, although the roots of its decline are clearly much deeper than that. So I wonder if you guys might briefly, before we, um, I wanna end with one last question and then we're gonna turn to the audience. Um, if you might discuss perhaps a little bit more in depth some ideas um, or some thoughts you might have, again, about why it is, A, that the left has not, quote unquote, benefited from this crisis as one might have expected, um, and you know, what if any future the left has, um, you know, sort of going forward in, um, you know, our liberal democratic systems. Um, so, start with Boris. Yeah, go ahead, Boris. Sorry, you're stuck in the middle there. Okay. Um, well, I think one of the main problems for the left has been that. Uh, what I've been trying to argue before, that uh, this idea of cosmopolitanism and, and multiculturalism that would automat automatically come with globalization uh, backfired. And so uh, basically um, the, uh, the terms, the political terms that have been used by the left um, sort of jumping on this bandwagon are, uh, are hollowed out. They don't mean anything anymore. So I think the left will have to reinvent some kind of a vocabulary or some a set of practices that is very much related to civic institutions in order to try to salvage liberalism or liberal democracy or a certain aspect of liberal democracy that needs to function outside markets. I think it's been done before. Um, I think uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the US has, has found a way of embedding liberalism also in a certain language that has been uh, uh, palatable also to a more mainstream audience, but it's certainly it's certainly a tough one. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, good question. Um, some working thesis. My, my first working thesis is that um, I, I don't like the notion, I'm nevertheless using it, uh, the dominant neoliberal discourse. I, I don't like it because I think it's under complex. It's, it's a catch-all phrase, but anyway. And, and I think that most left parties, at least in Europe, have been buying in on that very much. And maybe, again, the German social democracy is a good example, because we have these uh, famous Hartz reforms. Um, and I, I think uh, Schröder, in a way, broke the neck of the social democrats with that. It went against the convictions, and as I know some leading social democrats uh, quite well in person, I know how their heart bled, and I also know how Schröder pushed it through in the German Bundestag. And let me just say, this is not how a parliament should work. Yeah. A chancellor should not come and say, okay, you have 48 hours to read through this thick a package of laws, and then it's either yes or no, and if it's no, then I'm not your chancellor anymore. I mean, this is not how parliamentary democracy should work. So I'm, as you can see, I'm probably more of a fan of Angela Merkel much more than I'm a fan of Gerhard Schröder, because that's really a weird way um, of steering demo democratically. And I think that's a major credibility problem for the German social democrats. And I think the French social democrats have a similar credibility problem on another level. They are much more to the left than the German social democrats, but this doesn't help because they are expected to be even more to the left. So they have also lost some credibility. And then there's another point that's currently quite much ventilated in Germany, and re it refers to a thesis that's claiming that the problem of the left had, has been that instead of discussing redistribution, they have been discussing all these liberal values, you know, queer rights and women's rights and all these, uh, you know, uh, Nebenwidersprüche. I love this term. We have this very nice German term of Nebenwidersprüche. And Wolfgang Streeck, for instance, my favorite enemy in this respect, he claims that, yeah, let's return to the serious things and forget about all these little details, yeah? Mm -hmm. Again, Gerhard Schröder. Frauen und Gedöns, yeah, women and, uh, and the, these, these other things. For me, the problem is not that the left has been doing that, but that it has been neglecting the question of redistribution. So I think it, I guess it brings us back uh, about to a left that has to reinvent itself, but how should it do it? Um, and this sort of is, is what I wanted to say with my example of the school, yeah? If, if they don't see that education is, is really a, not a very, um, not, not, a, not, an, not an issue that raises suspicion of being a Marxist, then I don't know where they want to start. Yeah. 
while passing the microphone, maybe I can add one thought, which is um, besides credibility and narrative, I think what's also important is that the institutional networks that used to support social democracy in the US and also in the European context have fallen apart. With the, um, with the offshoring of manufacturing work to other places and the, uh, the coming of the service economy, um, there is no such, well, unionization rates have been plummeting, uh, especially in the US, and so these kinds of um, networks that were the supporters of social democracy simply aren't there anymore. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why Occupy Wall Street, for example, was a sudden out burst uh, for a short period of time, but wasn't able to sustain itself over a longer period of time because these institutional um, networks didn't exist. So I agree wholeheartedly with these comments. Let me just add a few. Um, it was not just Schroeder, who you may recall became the minister for Gazprom the minute he left, right? Or Barroso, who ran the European Commission and went straight to Goldman Sachs. Right, remember that one? Um, how about Tony Blair? Uh, doing all the things that, you know, a war criminal who runs an advisory practice to, 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 to dictators. Um, the entire labor front bench who all went into finance right after the financial crisis, after they bailed the banks. I mean, how much can you take your credibility with people and throw it under a bus? Alan Milburn, he used to be the health secretary under labor, now consults for an American firm that hopes to privatize large chunks of the national health system. I mean, w w why should I have a single iota of faith in these people? They were the ones that broke the bargain. There was no left. The left shot itself in the head for money. Now, the second part of it is the EU. Now, I'm a huge fan of the EU as a political project, monetary project, ooh, not so sure. But nonetheless, putting that to one side, think about the fact that today you've got an absolutely bonkers government in Italy. There's no, no two ways about it, right? And, you know, anti-vaxxers, for God's sake, I mean, really. Now, from an accountancy point of view, from a technocratic point of view, Italy has a problem. It has, a, it has the third largest debt market in the world, and I think it's the 11th biggest economy. Uh, they haven't grown in 20 years, and so basically they're bankrupt, right? That's it. That's the real story. They're, bu they're bust. They should just do a debt restructuring and go over it. But they're in this thing called the EU, and they can't do that because if they do, they'll blow up everybody else's financial system. So you vote for a bunch of crazies, and it turns out they can't do anything. They're essentially tweaking the budget deficit up towards 3%. And the response in Brussels is to send them to what's called the excessive deficit procedure and ultimately to fine them. Now, let's think about how silly this is. Italy's a net contributor to the budget of the EU. So the people who are writing your checks, you're going to fine them because they're doing what the people who voted for them kind of want them to do. That's a hell of a box to find yourself in. Okay. Great. So um, let me throw out one last question um, before we give the audience an opportunity to, um, to pose questions themselves. So it's always nice to end with the sort of classic what is to be done query, um, if we might continue on the Marxist track or the Leninist track, I guess we should say. Um, so ostensibly we're supposed to be talking about the death of liberalism and its rebirth. So let's talk, we've talked a lot about reasons for its perhaps demise, if not death. Let's talk now at the end about some things that one might be able to do, um, that political parties, governments, politicians might be able to do to help revitalize liberal democracy, to make it more responsive, to make it more effective. So if you were, you know, advising whatever, German government, Swedish government, American government, whatever, um, what might you suggest as sort of some concrete things in an ideal world that could be done to make liberal democracy attractive, responsive, effective again. Um, so let's maybe start, go ahead, Boris. I think since you're in the middle, we'll start with you. Then. Okay. Um, I think three things. One is redistribution, the other one is decommodification, and the other one is a question of legitimacy. I'll say a little bit more about this. Um, so redistribution, obviously, I think there is a need for s for social cohesion to exist. There is a need for a certain level of uh, of, uh, of equality. It's interesting. We just talked about how the left basically had an interest or a good analysis of what was going on, on after 2009. 
when I think of Colin Crouch's analysis, Mark's analysis, obviously, but many more uh, authors who have basically got it right, right? That if this goes on, Robert Reich has been talking about this even in 2008 and 2007. Um, if this kind of split in societies goes on, at some point there will be demagogues, and at some point there might be the threat of fascism. And nonetheless, um, there has been no, no way to capitalize on, on this, and I think we just gave some, some answers as to why that is. So I think redistribution is uh, crucial. Uh, Decommodification, so taking certain things out of the market, providing certain goods as public goods rather than private goods is essential. Um, the big question that we're also trying to address in, in the book is on which level, on which level of government is this supposed to happen? Can we just go back to nation states? Is this something that can be procured by nation states as such in a context of global competition? Or is this something we should think the other way around, not from the institutions that exist themselves, but from the goods themselves? So what we're trying to do is to launch a new type of discussion as to what kind of public good, first of all, we need, what needs to be provided for us to be free-thinking citizens and to participate in, in, in politics, and on which level of government should it be provided? Are there certain public goods that can be provided on the local scale? If so, maybe that helps to increase participation. It might also uh, help to increase legitimacy if people are involved in, the, in these deliberations and in, in procuring these public goods. Are there certain things like logistics, for example, that need to operate on a regional level? Yeah? Who benefits from this kind of public uh, good provision and how, how, can it be, how can it be provided and um, uh, is it a legitimate question? There are other goods like security or climate change or environmentally friendly policies that have, have to happen on a global level, right? We're obviously in a moment where global solutions seem very far off uh, and where renationalization seems to thwart all kinds of cosmopolitan visions. But at the same time, we're in a deep crisis and I think we need to address and articulate certain um, thorough, um, thorough questions and, and uh, try and give some maybe even utopian answers. Uh, what I find exciting at this moment in time is that many political scientists, many social scientists are thinking about pretty wild solutions, such as sortition, for example. Um, so government not by election, but by lot, right? Choosing random people to run the government, which would be one way, I mean, at least discussing it. Uh, it couldn't be any worse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I, I see the problems, but... Uh, Sortition is the idea. It's a very old idea. And uh, basically, I mean, the, the advantage of it would be to uh, create legitimacy for an institution and do away with party polit politics and with pol uh, career politicians. There are, there's a whole slew of problems that come with it as well, right? But I think it's, it's interesting and there should be some enthusiasm. We shouldn't just be talking about the apocalypse. I don't think that the apocalypse is a way of life that attracts many people <laughs> and that, what, that will bring majorities uh, for, for the next type of election. So I think this kind of thinking is, uh, is quite important. And uh, so yeah, questions of legitimacy are really at the heart of this. I'm wondering if the kind of trust that has been uh, has been wasted in the last decades is easy to rebuild. I, I hope that the pendulum swings back fast and uh, strongly, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a question that's very much open. Okay, thank you. Um, what could be done? First, um, I would like to say that we should restore what can be termed the democ democratic compromise or restore democracy's promises, uh, which obviously refers to redistribution, but which obviously also refers to, to a welfare state, or let's say social and cultural inclusion, in a sense. Um, we have not spoken about um, this debate of uh, financialist capi capitalism versus democracy so much, but there are many effects of uh, financialized capitalism that directly affect democratic rights. And I haven't also spoken about what is usually my main and my favorite topic, democracy in the European Union. And I think this is one main example uh, during the financial crisis. We, we didn't only have the, the austerity problem, we also had a big democracy problem. Because what happened in Greece was that uh, um, representative democracy only took place on paper, but not in practice. Because the Greek parliament could not anymore decide about its budget. Now, budgetary rights is the crown jewel of parliamentarism, and if you have a parliament in a representative democracy that doesn't have budgetary rights, you have a big uh, problem, and we have a label for that. It's called the defective democracy, at least in comparative politics. Um, and I think we have, in Europe at least, to speak about if we really want that, if we want a European Union that so severely affects um, 
affects uh, the sort of the national democracies. And then uh, what about good old political activism and political debate? I mean, why don't we have uh, an open political debate? Again, in the EU debate, politicization is usually discussed critically in the sense uh, Hoge Marx, oh my God, this puts the Allied project in danger. And I always respond, so what? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's have a good old democratic debate, why not? Yeah? And then uh, I have been talking so much about education. Uh, it has been uh, a promise of the 1950s and 1960s to start with education, to educate people, to create such a thing as Democrats and, uh, and a democratic society. And let me sort of, let me conclude, I have to say this now that I managed to send my children to a public school and to a public after school daycare in Frankfurt, but not because the system encouraged us, but because we battled as two political scientists with a PhD our way through the system. And we just sort of uh, created our solution and we found it. But don't ask how many documents we had to sign. And our children don't go to school where we live, but somewhere else, but where there is a daycare. Yeah? So, and if that were just the normal way how things went, I mean, sort of, if the normal way would just be that one school for everybody would be there, I think this would be changing um, a lot of things. So once again, I agree entirely, but I'm going to put a caveat on it. Uh, it's not that I don't believe in redistribution. I don't believe it's possible. And it's not possible because so much wealth and income is held by so few people who are globally collected. Their governments essentially at least turn a blind eye to global tax avoidance. There's an incredible global tax avoidance industry. The London property market is essentially one giant laundromat for cleaning money and no one seems to want to touch that. So the notion that, you know, we can raise taxes, well, on who? I mean, you know, the, the, the middle classes that used to be able to fund a lot of things, they're maxed out and they're in debt. And the people who have the money, they don't give a damn about public goods. So you've got to go somewhere else. So I think about it this way. Thomas Becquery wrote a book which had, could summarize to basically a piece of algebra, which is R's greater, greater than G. So the rate of return on assets is higher than the rate, of return, the, rate, the rate of growth in wages. So over the long run, what happens is those with assets grow like this and those with wages go like that. That's the inequality gap. So let's turn it around. Why can't we have R for everyone? Why can't we have assets for the 80% rather than 20%? Well, how do you do that, Mark? Well, oddly enough, I'm writing a book about this. But I'll give you one example in closing, right? So we think of sovereign wealth funds. We tend to think of Abu Dhabi and Norway and other nefarious oil states. But here's a way anyone can do this. So imagine that this is the American, actually do the British government, let's do the American government because the numbers are easier. So let's say that you've got a huge inequality problem that's taken 30 years to generate in the United States, which is what's happened, right? Now, how long would it take to reverse that? At least half that time. So let's say I've got a 15 year window. So every time there's a financial crisis and they happen all the time, and they're gonna happen with increasing frequency, the only thing that the 1% want to hold is government debt. All the stuff about austerity is crap. They basically want what's called a safe asset. And the only safe asset is a government bond because they've got intergenerational tax capacity. So the government's cost of capital falls to zero whenever there's a financial crisis. So you bail them by swapping their assets for bonds. That's what quantitative easing was essentially was. Now, let's do this. But next time that it all goes bang, what we do is we issue an extra 20% of GDP in bonds. They will find easy buyers. It won't push up interest rates. It won't cause inflation. They can't get enough of it. That's why boons trade negative. Right, so take that 20%. In the United States, that's four trillion. Let's take that four trillion and put it in a sovereign wealth fund, and let's buy an entire portfolio of global equities. Let's buy everything, completely diversified, and then that's got a six percent premium over inflation. So let's run six percent compounded for 15 years. After six years, I can pay the original four trillion back without even doing a thing. And then after that, I've got $12 trillion that I can do whatever I want with. And I didn't tax anyone to create that money. Now, imagine I could give that to the bottom 80% to go to school, to uh, pay off debt, education loans, to start a business, for labor mobility to get from one part of the country to another, and tie that up to other policies, which also encourage asset formation, particularly amongst millennials, who are the first generation in human history that have more debt than assets before they even start their families. I think if you focus on that, you can get somewhere. That's what we need, R for everyone. It's a hummable tune. Great, all right, so that's a great place to stop and see if um, folks have questions for our panelists. In looking to the future, uh, 
talking about movements, cultural and political movements, versus political parties. I think, Boris, you talked about parties revitalizing themselves, reinventing themselves. Is that really possible for existing parties to do that, or do we need new parties? Do we need movements to really create new parties that really represent the liberalism that we have had in the past? Thank you. And I'll use the sort of break in the rhythm to do something I forgot because I was so excited to talk after Mark, is to thank Juliane and Zara for uh, their great support and uh, the professional work and for the invite. So it's been a great and very productive time and I just wanted to get this uh, off my chest. Um, well, obviously it's difficult and um, uh, yes, parties can realign over time uh, and they, they, can, uh, they can adapt and reinvent themselves. Obviously that's what they did after the 1970s uh, and obviously that's part of the problem. Um, not exactly sure. I mean, if we're looking at the case of the German SPD, uh, there is uh, <laughs> there is Kevin Kühnert, and that seems to be the only person really who has some kind of a vision of how the SPD could be reinvented um, differently. So it looks like um, I don't have a lot of hope uh, for for that to happen. With the Democrats, it might look a little different. Um, at least that's what people are trying to, to emphasize in the midterm elections that there is some kind of a new set of politicians, female politicians and uh, uh, politicians with minority backgrounds uh, that, that, are, that are coming into, into the parties. So uh, I don't think that they're gonna die away immediately. I think they have an important role to play. Parties uh, help coordinate um, and, uh, and um, uh, aggregate interest in society. They help the political discourse. Uh, so I think sortition in and of itself, to pick up that uh, example, cannot, cannot replace everything that, that parties do. So I, I, maybe I'm conservative that way. Um, the short answer is yes, I think they can if they want. But that means uh, leaving the bubble. And I, I have really the strong impression that, that this is the problem. And uh, I would say that in most cases where we have seen breakdowns of old party systems, it's because politicians at some point were unable to leave their self-reflective or circular bubble, if you want. I would argue that has been the case in Italy, it has been the case in France, and this is probably a lot what we see happening in Germany. And again, I'm quite impressed because what happens in the Christian Democrat Party is that um, Angela Merkel, she saw the signs coming. Uh, this is why she is, I think, very much wiser than Horst Seehofer, because she tries to overlook them uh, heavily. And she said, okay, I never wanted to be carried out of my office, so now I declare that I resign. Um, something that she always refused to do, to separate the positions of chair of the Christian Democrat <coughs> Party and of chancellor. And what we see is that we have an open race. Uh, people are totally crazy. There are 12 candidates for becoming chair of the Christian Democrat Party. And the Social Democrats are just standing there with their mouths open saying, okay, a week ago they were in crisis. Now it's again us who are in crisis and they have started their, re uh, their renewal. Yeah? And I think uh, there is a, a lot of truth in it. Um, I'm not saying the Social Democrats should also change chairs because they had, I don't know how many, 12 chairs in the last seven years or something like that, but a lot. But you, you can see that it, it, it works. I, I think it works, but they have to leave, uh, parties have to leave the bubble. I would also say that there are more social democrats than Kevin Kuhnert, but that's maybe a debate for the reception. <laughs> okay, um, I think there's another Hi, um, this might be a, a little bit of a long-winded question. I'll try to keep it short. Something that ha hasn't really been touched on, I think enough is is the cultural forces at play behind behind uh, these systems that are coming into play. I, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, is it really possible to reform our way back to true democracy when I feel like a lot of this, this populist movement is sort of saying democracy and capitalism are at war with each other. And a lot of people, at least in the US, are, are choosing capitalism um, over democracy. Like there's a huge, I think, authoritarian pull here. Uh, I mean, I just had a conversation with my dad. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have some grueling conversations over Thanksgiving in a few weeks, but uh, I basically said to him, how, how do you reconcile the fact that we have three branches of government that, uh, you know, when you look at the individual races, none of them had the popular vote, but, you know, Republicans are in control of everything. Uh, and I basically said, do you think that that's okay? And he said, well, I don't think that it, it, it's okay to have a, a true democracy because 
uh, and this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but he said, uh, if, if the people know they can vote themselves a raise, they will. That's what happened in Greece. <laughs> and, and, but I think that that's like a, 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 a real movement in America, at least, is this idea that people sort of maybe to cope with the fact that we have this rising in, rise in inequality only for the top 20%, uh, is to sort of look at that and say, well, that's just the natural way of things, and the way to to see that is, and so uh, yeah. my my question is, my question is, can we reform this, or is it just inevitable that we're going to have uh, neo feudalism in the form of corporate right. powers? So I'm 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 a, I'm a fan of capitalism and democracy, and I don't think they're necessarily in contradiction. <laughs> we just we've just got a bit mixed up. Um, let's think about Brazil. So I've been reading a lot about Brazil, trying to figure out what's going on, because most of the reporting is really superficial. You got all this stuff about Brazil, the commodity producer. It's like it's a huge diversified economy. It's simply not, right? But anyway, the point is, what were some of the forces that drove Bolsonaro to power? One of them was a university reform. So it used to be the case that the white middle classes in Brazil, and it's a very racially segmented society, they basically had a guaranteed free ticket for publicly funded higher education. That was part of the deal. And what happened was they did a university reform and suddenly black kids were getting in. And there was a limited number of places and that freaked out the middle classes. The second one was every family, it was like the South of the United States in the 50s, every family, middle class family, had a maid. That's how you did lo labor mobility. You basically got out of the poor regions, get on the bus, you become a maid in an urban environment. And what the Lula government did was they gave those people workers' rights and pensions. And suddenly huge swages of the middle classes couldn't have a maid anymore. So you took my maid from me, and my son doesn't get any university. Damn right I want a general coming in and kicking your commie ass. So you can see exactly how those types of cultural politics get played out. I think it's, I, wait, I, I can't, I have to, I have to say I think it's very important to note that in the Brazilian case as well, the ruling Workers' Party, which did amazing social reforms, was incredibly corrupt as was the entire system. And if you look across many of these cases, I mean, Hungary is just the most obvious example. I mean, many of these things are triggered by deep corruption on the part of establishment politicians and parties. And so a lot of the resentment is well-founded. I mean, putting aside these other kinds of things, right? Your question about, you know, sort of capitalism. I mean, this is a long-standing debate that folks on the right have had, that libertarians in particular have worried about, right? Which is, you know, if you give people the vote, they're gonna vote to do things that will threaten property rights and markets. That's why you're supposed to have a balance, right? That's why you're supposed to have democracy, because democracy is equality, right? Democracy means everybody's supposed to have the same rights to vote, right? And so when things get out of whack, then you begin to see problems. And so the question is how it got out of whack, and I think that's what we've been talking about, and then how might one restore the balance so that those two things can work together um, harmoniously. Um, oh, Claudia. I, I have to add something to this because it seems to me to be a very American debate. Yeah? I'm, I'm not sort of uh, downplaying this, but uh, the German economic wonder is based on what Ludwig Erhard, again a Christian Democrat, termed social market economy. So nobody would say that capitalism and redistribution are in contradiction. Well, yeah, but th that's sort of 50 years, uh, 50 years after. Yeah, they say that sort of it has had it has got out of joint in Germany, but if we look at economic inequality in Germany and if we compare it with economic inequality in the U.S. and if we compare what is left of the German welfare state with the welfare state in the U.S. Um, you will see huge differences, yeah? So I think that this debate of like, oh my God, uh, we'll have the Marxists coming everywhere, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, to me really seems to be a very American debate, and I think that this sort of, this idea of social uh, market economy to me is a very appealing one. If you want to reconcile uh, capitalism and democracy, um, yeah, and by the way, there have been parties um, arguing that it's legitimate to be against capitalism, yeah? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean we have to have an authoritarian communism, but uh, there have been people inventing democratic socialism and things like that. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's legitimate to at least uh, reflect about um, alternatives. 
maybe I can just add one thing on uh, Bernie Sanders, I mean, who called himself a socialist, but uh, if you look at it from a German perspective, that looks like old school social democracy, right? Um, and it's interesting, he didn't ask for an economic revolution, he was speaking about a political revolution. He didn't say we have to collectivize the means of production, uh, but he was basically talking about these... Can we have health care? Exactly. <laughs> All he said was, can we please have health care? I am a socialist. What? <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher had collective health care. Over there. The general idea, uh, I want to address the question of the superficiality of the media in Brazil. It, uh, it's definitely very superficial, whatever you get here from Bra about Brazil from the media. But in my opinion, the, the general huge problem is that the superficiality of media in principle um, stops the rich from being uh, checked. Uh, or the, the, wherever the powerful are uh, of being object, uh, and, and, and checked. The, the, the loss of the fourth estate is, is tremendous. The death of objectivity is tremendous. Um, there are probably not too many Trump fans here, but the general idea is of politicians nowadays. They are empowered to make money for their family and their, for themselves. And they are saying to themselves, and in Germany is a much nicer word, nach mir die Sintflut, which is in, in Germany the, f the big flood, the one that Noah built an ark for, has a, has a special meaning. In English, there is only the word flood, so after me, the flood doesn't mean the same, okay? Trump, who probably a lot of people here don't particularly like, says this should have been done 50 years ago. And the demonization of the political opposition is a, 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 um, a cutting off of any kind of conversation that is real on for the benefit of saying, oh, this guy is that, this guy is that, and you're talking about socialists and Trump is a Nazi, which offends me as a German that anybody should be called a Nazi that is not a Nazi, okay? Nobody should be called Hitler, uh, and I don't care what, what, whether it's uh, a journalist in CNN or a journalist in the Washington uh, Post or in the New York Times, it is disgusting that we discuss our political opposition in those kinds of terms rather than to look at what are the actual issues that these people want to talk about. And the, the, for me, the death of objectivity, which the New York Times in, in 2016, I believe, said, are oh, we gonna throw that out the window? Even that before then already, it was probably 75% in one way. Do you have a question? Today it's 95%, yeah, the address is, and it's, Almost as bad in Germany, the, 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 the question is the only way, and what do you think about the death of objectivity? The only way that we can fix things is by having real discussions and, 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 and to basically kill political um, correctness within that political discussion because with political correctness you can't have a discussion. I'm not so, okay, I'm not so sure it's correctness per se, right? I th but I think the point goes like this. There's a very interesting economics paper about media control. And if you have oligarchic media control, if you have Italy, where it essentially got Berlusconi-type ownership, or you have even Britain, where you have Sky with very high penetration, and you don't have a robust public system, then you tend to get hyper-populism. Right, because then you can basically be funded by the true crazies, and that's sort of what really pushes politics to the extreme. So there is some work on that that suggests that's the case. But you can also get to the other extremes, and just to lighten the mood a little bit, there's a wonderful example of how nuts this gets with the BBC. So the BBC was very politicized in the prior decade as being very much on Labour's side and all this sort of stuff. There was a huge politicization. So they, they said, oh no, we'll make sure that we're completely even-handed. We've always even-handed. But sometimes there's just not two sides. So th they had a, a, a budget recently, and a huge item in the budget was half a billion or a billion pounds or something for fixing potholes. So the BBC went out and tried to find someone who would think it was a bad idea to fix potholes. I'm not making this up. And so they found some guy that runs a garage who obviously like makes money, you know, if people crunch through potholes. And they said, so we went to Fred and we went to Sherry. Sherry fixes potholes. Hi, Sherry. Do you think it's a bad idea for Philip Hammond, the chancellor, to be given money? And Sherry went, no. And he went, great, thanks. So if objectivity is that kind of performance where you're simply going to find A and not A, you're still not talking about what needs to be talked about. So to give the earlier example, the German replacement rate in population is 1.4. Your pension promises are 80%. You need migrants. 
or you die as a society. That's what you really need to talk about, not this bullshit that gets said on the television. Hi. So just going along with what you said, you need migrants. But the type of migrants that you're <coughs> getting in with this tremendous influx are on a different level than the society. We're living in a very technologically sophisticated world, and we don't have the kind of jobs around that someone could take who could just do manual labor and maybe work their way up. We're on a much higher level, so it's very daunting, very intimidating, and then you have people with coming in with very different value systems who don't necessarily want to trade those value systems in for the dominant or mainstream value system. So my question is, is this really going to work or are the immigration figures coming in, the people coming in, rather than propping up the society, rather than helping to fund the pensions, going to put an extra weight on, and what do you think about that? Maybe I can, can uh, say something on, on sort of the, the, this, this big um, movement of refugees we had to Germany in 2015. So first of all, many of the especially Syrian refugees have a very good education because they were war refugees. Um, that's something uh, that, that, that one needs to know and needs to take in mind. Other than that, obviously there's some truth in what you have been saying. And um, to me, it's one of the biggest problems, not so much of Germany, but of the current European Union, um, it's not sort of the, 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 the influx of, of war refugees, but it's the fact that uh, every day people die in the Mediterranean because they risk their lives and the life of their children because they want to have uh, a little share of the European wealth. Um, and they come from Africa. And they come from what we call failed states or what we call poor states or whatsoever. And uh, it is really damn difficult to have a proper answer to this. Because uh, because there is sort of it, it is so complex um, that that nobody really has sort of the one answer. The answer can obviously not be we just let them drown in the Mediterranean. That cannot be the answer. The answer cannot be just we put them to prison in Africa. So in order to stop them. So to me, one answer is to to think about what actually are we in the sense of Europeans doing in Africa. Uh, that uh, pushes them to come to Europe. And I think there are some things to to think about. Then I'm sort of again at my education points uh, because I think it's sort of too simplified to say that nothing can be done and they cannot be integrated. Because most of especially the Syrian refugees and also people from other countries um, have been integrated rather well. All the numbers say that it has been working rather well in Germany. And we have these very few exceptions. And in one of the texts that I read today, um, it, uh, the, the people talked about terrorism. Yeah? We have some few exceptions, very few. So obviously, uh, sort of percentages of certain crimes have risen a little bit with an influx of one million people, which is to perfectly normal. Um, but on the average and in general, it seems <coughs> to work out quite well. But sort of to, to make a point, and now I have to say something that I don't really like, um, but probably if you sort of switch away all humanitarian aspects and you see this in strictly economic terms and again i think that's the, it's, it's, it's a, there's a trade-off here and we have to think about what we want to be we as germans in that case or we as europeans but if you see it strictly in economic terms then you would say okay we need to have a migration uh, law we need to have like a green card system you uh, sort of collect points and we only want to admit the most uh, qualified migrants which is personally not my solution for two reasons because we have been discussing for the last one and a half hours the problems and the tensions of capitalism and democracy, so I don't see why we should switch back to that um, in that aspect. But also because it would trigger a brain drain from the states where those people are badly needed. Yeah. So again, I would, would really like to underline that the problem is really very complex and it's not, it's not, I don't have unfortunately the easy solution. But if I have all the easy solutions that you are asking us for, I get very rich as a quality policy consultant, I think. Just a couple of ones on the cultural differences one. So one of my favorite books is one that Sherry gave to me 20 years ago. Can you remember which one it is? How the Irish Became White. Oh, that's a good book. It's a very good book. And what's the main point of that book? Well, that's 
There was a time in the United States when the Irish were not considered white because they were so culturally different, essentially, from the white Anglo-Saxon mainstream, and they were seen as unassimilable. I cannot really say that they word were correctly. Capists. They could That's right. never be That's reconciled right. to the American right. way of life. Right. Besides Helen, not from Boston. <laughs> Do you think it's true that President Macron of France is preparing to be the de facto leader of the European Union? And for example, in, in countries like Poland or in parts of Germany outside of cities, what can the European Union and Germany itself or Poland itself do to try to thwart nationalist tendencies also among young people, which for me is a very scary phenomenon. Xenophobic, nationalist, and Well, maybe I can address the first question. Um, uh, I guess that this question addr addresses this notion when Merkel is gone that he's basically the standard bearer of, uh, of liberal democracy. Well, I think part of that question is, um, uh, is cor uh, correct because uh, he has articulated a vision of European identity which nobody other has. So I think there, this has been valuable. Um, he's seen the, that there's a moment now or there, there's a need for this kind of, uh, kind of political consolidation perhaps, even though there doesn't seem to be a grassroots movement that would support that. Uh, but I think he's, he's um, accentuated a couple of important questions. On the other hand, he has basically flexibilized the mar uh, labor market in France, and uh, I think he's pushing, uh, he's deepening or he's producing a crisis in the long run um, that, uh, that works at cross-purpose um, from, uh, at least if our analysis is right, that this is where the crisis comes from. Um, as <coughs> As to the question of, uh, of radicalization of among the youth, well, I, I guess that's a very tough one to answer. I mean, the, the, everybody talks about the 1930s right now, not just in the US, but also in Germany and in Europe. I think that the fatalism is perhaps a little overemphasized. I think there's also a certain, um, I mean, we have a position as political scientists and we're trying to uh, you know, come to conclusions through certain analyses, but at the same time, we, we have an influence on the public debate, at least if it's just a very modest one or a very moderate one. So I think we shouldn't overemphasize that we're already so sort of close to 1933 or 1938. I think there's a sort of, sort of politics of indignation that doesn't really help us. Um, well, I, I can say that uh, because I've just uh, read all those uh, very sophisticated evaluations of the World Value Survey and so on, um, there is no general problem of young people being more skeptical of democracy than the older generations. And in fact, the problem is more the older generations that vote for the right-wing populists than the young people. So that's maybe one answer. And that's probably slightly more optimistic because there is a sort of a biological a positive biological bias for, for democracy um, in that. Yeah? Then I think Germany and Poland are really two very different cases. Um, there is this problem of right-wing extremism, um, not so much under young people, but it is there in Eastern Germany. And I think Poland is a very different case because we have this right-wing nationalist, right-wing populist, very conservative, very Catholic movement. And uh, just let me sort of raise a point for the wine reception. One thing that we haven't talked about yet at all is how much this um, problem of populism is a, is a male phenomenon and is a phenomenon of conservative gender relations. In this class uh, that I held about the right-wing populists across the world, including Brazil, one thing that they had all in common is that they all were men and they all assigned very specific and mostly very devoted roles to women. Uh, and the top was obviously hit off by Jair Bolsonaro, um, compared to whom uh, Donald Trump definitely is a feminist. Yeah. I don't think I can top that line. I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, all, for coming. And um, yes. Thank you. thank you so much, Sherry, Mark, Boris, Claudia, for this very dynamic, insightful, provocative, and entertaining intellectual ping pong game you guys have been playing. I, I really enjoyed it personally, and I think everybody else did. We have a lot of food for thought to take home. We have things to discuss with our parents or uh, family over Thanksgiving. <laughs> and we should be bold, and we should challenge uh, the people who don't agree with us, and we should be challenged too, and uh, we should 
talk and have a real dialogue. And uh, we will keep doing this here at Deutsches House. So come back on Monday. Thank you. And enjoy the wine. <laughs> <laughs>